This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And we have a very exciting show for all you greeny pinkles and commies out there. I uh, really think capitalists are the pigs of the earth. Uh, we have a very exciting program to you because we're going to be talking about the Green New Deal, which uh, you know Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez and all these guys are talking about. The, pro- the trouble with most of these socialists, they don't know how to make money. That's the problem. All they do is bitch. So this is a very, very important program because today we're going to be talking about how you make millions as a greenie. You know, that's going to be a very exciting show. Any comments, Kim? Well, our, our guest is Marin Katusa, founder of Katusa uh, research and uh, Robert's been a big fan of Marin's for for quite a while now, um, but he has a whole new plan and he's definitely not. I don't know that I would call him a greenie, <laughs> definitely not a socialist. It's a greenie, greenie. But he's figured out how to. Well, he's going to tell you how to yeah. combine green and existing energies. It's it's very exciting and it's uh, cutting edge and that's what he does. And so all you well, environmentalists, socialists, commie, pinko pigs out there, listen up because this is how capitalists are going to make billions while you bitch and moan about environments. So this is a very important show here. And let me just say that Marin is one of the most successful resource, resource venture capital fund managers. Um, all, all types of funding, some of the largest in the U.S., some possibly largest in the world, um, but he's got the experience, he's got the knowledge, and uh, very, very, very brilliant young man. And, and not bad for a math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and a math teacher on top of it. So welcome to the show, Marin. My pleasure, guys. So explain how Ocasio-Cortez, you know, I don't know if you follow American politics because you're a Canadian, but all these greenies bitching about the economy or the environment, uh, they're actually on the right track, aren't they? They are, but you see, the problem with the champagne socialists is they don't actually want to get their hands dirty, <laughs> right? And uh, the, 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 the hard part, you know, thinking is hard, so judging is why that's what they do. And it leads them to not understand the actual realities. You know, they want a green world, which we all want a better future for our children and descendants than we have today. Mm-hmm. But to have an electrical world, you have to have copper, you have to have rare earths, you have to have all these aspects. And yet, where are Apple and Tesla and all these uh, in, uh, revolutionary technology companies relying on? Well, you know, 98% of the rare earths are coming from China and they're not coming from environmental standards that meet the North American level. Uh, cobalt is still being mined by, you know, children. Uh, and, and that's not being discussed about. Now, th- those are the details that the champagne socialists don't want to talk about. And, you know, what I've done actually is roll up my sleeves and, and I have a track record of doing it. And I've learned the hard lessons, Robert. It's not like I'm this perfect investor. I have lost money in it and I keep going at it. And, you know, I funded the largest geothermal plant built in America in 50 years. And you know how you learn how to be better is by doing it, right? Like you got to keep going at it and you learn the mistakes. And I kept going and eventually we financed, became the second largest shareholder in Canada's largest green energy producer. So that's kind of how you go about it. The problem with, with, with the, the movement is not understanding the actual realities and the cost. So like when, let's just say Biden hypothetically wins, you know that billions of dollars is going to go into the offshore uh, wind sector, but the inflation that's going to happen is going to be very similar to what happened when the first uh, Green Deal Obama came in, where anything with the word green in it took off. For example, in the geothermal world in the, uh, by, you know, the early 2009, anything with a geothermal word in it was trading at incredible valuations, such that if they built exactly what they said they would do on budget and on time, these things were priced for perfection before they even drilled a single well. So I started telling everybody, this makes no mathematical sense. And the, the firm at the time was called Geothermex. They were kind of the authority in the industry and they would slap on these things called P90s or P50. And I couldn't believe all these bankers flying around. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of financings were just happening weekly like this based off of a P90. So I stood up at the big investment conference and I said, P so what? I'm probably the guy in the industry that understands the math better than anyone else. And I said, 
you guys are using P90s and you don't even understand the probability of these things. A P90 is not a good thing, but from a sales pitch, it sounded like, hey, you got a 90% success rate here. That's how they were selling it. All right, as an, as an old guy, you remember, I remember when you put .com after something, it sold. Yeah, that was the equivalent, and, exactly. And, and what you're, but this is what I'm getting at. And so what you're saying is anything with Green New Deal after it now is going to be the big move. Got to be very careful and look at the actual costs. So, so what you did is you changed the accounting system on it. Well, what I did was, yeah. So I came out with, uh, after looking at all this stuff, I, I became a very disliked individual in the sector because I talked reality, right? And, and the world doesn't like harsh realities, you know, and they like the concept of a, of a, future, a green, the possibilities, butterflies and, you know, flowers. The problem is uh, building these things are very difficult. Geothermal wells, you got to drill deep and we're talking big boreholes. These are not like oil patch wells. We're, we're talking 18 inch bore wells and you go down to about eight inches. Big, very expensive wells. And you piss and, off every environmentalist. Oh, totally. But, you know, they were doing it in the disguise of green energy, right? So they, were, they had a little bit more. Uh, and, and, the different, and the difference between you and them is the question they were always asked is, how are you going to pay for it? Oh, we'll, well, we'll, oh, we'll figure it out. But yeah, they never well, could it, answer it, the question. You're answering that question. Well, today with MMT, uh, it'll be, uh, there won't be a shortage of money for it. Specifically in this world of ESG, where you have environmental, social, and governance, there'll be much MMT, more money. Marxist monetary theory? <laughs> Pretty much, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, with, with the modern monetary theory, or you can think of it as the Marxists, uh, regardless, they control the taps of the digital printing, and right. the money will right. go into the sector. Right. But the so reality what is, is, what is ES, ES, do you have something? ESG. So ESG stands for environmental and social governance, right? So it's the new tag phrase that all of the governments, the socials, the NGOs, they want to make sure it meets this social license. Right. The problem is who issues a social license? Correct. No so, so that's what, what Marin could do. I mean, he's, he's, he's my man right now, man, because what he's saying is the next dot com is going to be anything with ESG or MMT or anything environmental. Just, just like Obama, he came out with Solyndra. Remember that thing? That disaster. And, and there was many of those. There was billions of dollars wasted. Yes, yeah. Tommy Pinko socialist. They fund anything that sounds green, but they don't know that what makes them talking. feel good. Is that true? So that's why I, 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 when I, when I was reading your, your thing on GBOE, green barrels of oil, keyword is equivalent. It's Correct. a kind word. That's so going to be the future. Like that. Yeah. So let me just take a step back how it was developed. So when the big, you know, the seven sisters, Exxon, Chevron, all the big oil companies, when they really controlled uh, the geopolitical world and the financial world, the way the fangs, you know, the Microsofts and the Amazons do today uh, and the Googles back in the day, the oil patch, they realized that they were, you know, depleting their reserves. So they needed to cook the books a little bit. That's, that's the reality of it. And they had a lot of gas. But gas wasn't, it was never as valuable as oil. Think of it as gold and silver. Gold is oil, silver is the natural gas. That's kind of where it was. So the accountants all got together and they said, hey, if we can figure out a way from a mathematical standpoint to take natural gas, put it on our books as oil, and that's where barrels of oil equivalent came from. So that was this big boon, and now all the oil companies had bigger reserves on their books, and they could pump their chest and tell their investors they've done this great job. They've increased their barrels of oil equivalent by 25% over the last few years. Executives got paid more. The bankers got paid more. Everyone felt great about it. So that's where the industry went. And I kind of sat back and said, you know, Early on, I saw what was, because I traveled so much around the world, I said, you know, I'm out of the oil game. I was early to the shale game. Uh, luckily, I had a geology professor named Dr. Mark Buston that ended up working for me. And because of him, I got really early into the shale game before it became a catchphrase. And we recognized early on that natural gas was going to be flared and would become worthless. So the natural gas, basically one barrel of oil was equivalent to 6,000 MBTUs which means it was a six to one price ratio. So they could cook their books at six to one. But when oil was at a hundred bucks and gas was going at, you know, a dollar 50, they were still using that BOE to look at their reserves from a financial standpoint. I said, this makes no sense, but nobody cared because the system kept going. Everyone was getting paid. So I was one of the early guys saying, Hey guys, pay attention to the math here. 
and nobody wanted the truth. So I said, okay, when this all kind of comes unraveling, these oil companies to survive are going to have to diversify and get into the green energy patch and the nuclear patch. And I came up with what was called the green barrels of oil equivalent. Now to do so, I had to bring back some of my fancy calculus and I published this. It's all on my website. I sat with all the executives and chairmen and they all thought, yeah, it's a really good idea, but the market's not going to accept it. The Jibo concept. Now, even though I was a few years early to this, you saw BP just come out and said, you know, essentially after a three day investor conference, we're not an oil company anymore. We're going to become a green energy energy provider. And to do that, GBOs are going to play a huge role moving forward. And, and like we talked about offline, rather than having a reserve life index to say an oil well or an oil field has 10 years, then you have to find more oil to replace it. When you look at solar or wind, you're talking about infinite resources. So yeah, they can cook these books in a way that investors won't understand. And I created the math formula for this, so I understand it better than anyone else. And I'm saying, this is where the industry's going. And you know, me and my subscribers have made a fortune off of this. So it, so it's the trend a, in motion. How are, a, how are you making a fortune off of a uh, calculus formula? Yeah, so what we did was we looked at the valuations of the actual producers. So number one, I told everyone, you don't need to get involved in developing these assets because the cost of capital is so high. These are very expensive, like right. to build a geothermal plant, to build a run of river project, to build a big like 200 megawatt uh, uh, wind farm. Uh, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars. And these small little companies, their cost of capital is just too high to compete with the big boys. So that was the first thing. So for example, a company like Altera, which my subscribers came in, and it's Canada's largest pure green energy producer, we were buying this at you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 NAV. And today the equivalent is 23 bucks. We were in at $3. And this thing spits out a dividend and it's just rock solid with the Interjects group of uh, renewable companies. Another way that we did in March, uh, my favorite company, uh, even though I was a big shareholder of Altura, uh, one of the reasons I did Altura was I wanted to own Brookfield. Now, Brookfield is the world's, think of it as the Exxon of green energy. And think about this, like I'm one of the largest players in my game and I contacted the CEO and the chairman. I said, I'd love to be able to interview to my, my team. And they're like, you know, Marin, thanks, but no thanks. Whereas most companies would die to be interviewed in my little network. These guys are the real deal. They paid out when I wrote it up at $31 for my subscribers. Um, we, we got a spin out of two companies out of it. At $31 is paying a 9% dividend lowest cost of capital in the industry. They're the world's biggest producer of green energy. They're rock solid and we're up almost 200% in less than a year. What kind and of this thing? What kind of uh, green energy does Brookfield produce? Oh, they, they do hydro. So hydro, think of it as the, uh, right. the ultimate green energy because it's the most valuable uh, when you look at the hydro dams. So they're the number one in hydro in both Canada, US and Brazil. They've got massive diversified uh, across the platform. They just bought out, they bought Sun Edison in the US uh, through default. These guys, basically Bruce Flats is the, you know, the, the, the brains behind the scene. He has an incredible team behind them. And it's such a well-run company. They've got, you know, as Warren Buffett talks about a moat around them, they are the most diversified and strongest growth they, platform they of solar? green energy in the industry. Do they do solar? They, oh yeah, they have it across the board, they have it. So how, do, how, how do they have solar farms? Well, they just keep buying assets, companies that go bankrupt because of the cost of capital, they've consolidated and they've been running at this. Their growth since 2005 is unprecedented in the industry. They are, and like, I'm a big shareholder. I get no compensation from the company whatsoever. I'm just saying me and my subscribers think that this one is the number one way to play it because it costs the capital, their dividend. And, you know, let's take COVID for example, they, they've, their production and cash flow hasn't even seen a blip during this time. It truly is pandemic proof, recession proof. This thing is rock solid. And, and think of it as Exxon in the, uh, 40s or 50s. It's future. Oh, are they, are they all using your equation, the Jibos? And no. So Brookfield, and, and so this equation, when I sent it to them, they don't need to. But what I was trying to get at with Jibos is that this is what's going, the oil companies are going to have to play major catch up into the sector. So Brookfield doesn't need to do that because they don't need to 
juice their numbers, let's say. Brookfield but the was only, already a, a, a green energy company. To start. They're the largest in the world. Yeah. They're rock solid. But what I was getting at with the oil companies like BP, Chevron, Exxon, they're playing major catch up now. And they're stuck with this, you know, historical books of BOEs, barrels of oil equivalent. And the future for them is to go into the GBOs or the green barrels of oil equivalent because that's how their financials and that's how their debt is set up. So the, for way, them to you're survive. Up, so the way your followers made money was you added them into Brookfield. That's Correct. Right. And we got in when it was cheap. Uh, and now that it's, um, look, we've taken a free ride. It's called the Katusa free ride where you reduce your risk and you hold this company. Like I told my subscribers forever for free, right. collect right. industry top dividends. Yep. It, it's that's right. how you want to play this game. Reduce we're your gonna, risk, and collect yeah. dividends. And we're forever. going to talk about how to become a subscriber when in the next section. Okay. So we'll, think we'll be right back. Uh, this is fantastic. This is good. Yeah, it's great. It's the thing I, I love about this because what Marin did changed the accounting. And I was a student of Dr. R. Buckman's or Fuller, and he talked about where our accounting system was all off. And for those of you who know Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Rich Dad is about accounting. And where Rich Dad is going is, is into what's called cosmic accounting. So at Marin, you know, we're translating right now, Marin Katusa is talking about is this translation this trans transformation into cosmic accountant. In other words, free energy. We come back, we'll be talking more to Marin Katusa about the future and with the biggest investment going because energy is the biggest energy in, uh, in, in, is the biggest product in the world. So also is being wasted, it's free. We come back, we're talking more to Marin Katusa on the Rich Dad radio program. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about the money. Uh, the good news is we're going to tell you about the best investment you can get into. The bad news is you can't get into it. <laughs> I think that's kind of funny personally, but that just shows you how important our guest is today. And uh, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, and YouTube. If you have a comment anytime you, you listen to it. And all of our podcasts are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them because we're an education company. We're going to be talking about investments, but we make no recommendations. We make zero recommendations. Although, according to our guest, Marin Katusa, I, and I believe it is the best investment you can make today, except it's closed. So really, that's what it's about. But anyway, we don't make recommendations. You know, we're purely educational. Please we, we go, to, go to Rich Dad Radio. Dot com. Listen to this program again. You'll get twice as smart. And then most importantly, if a friends, family, and business associates, listen to it and then discuss it. Then you're, you'll go quantum on intelligence here about the best investment in the future. That's today. So um, our guest today is Marin Katusa. His company is Katusa Research. And I've been a fan of his for years. He's in the, he's in the, um, they call it the resource sector. Kim and I have taken several companies public, oil, gold, uh, silver. We've also had uh, many shale projects in the South and in Dakota. So anyway, it's, it's near and dear to our heart, but when he's talking about GBOE, green barrels of oil equivalent, that is kind of why the Rich Dad Company was founded. It's because we're using the wrong accounting system. And my teacher was Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller, and he talked about cosmic accounting, that our biggest, most important asset is energy, and most of it is free. That's the hard thing for people to understand, it's free. And Fuller says, if they just let, you know, it says back in, the, back in the 80s when I studied with Fuller, there was 4 billion people on planet Earth. And he says there's 4 billion billionaires on planet Earth, except that somebody doesn't let them put them, you know, they want to put a meter between them and the sun or a meter between the oil and them. And all of this energy is God given. And energy is the biggest, biggest industry in the world. Civilization runs on energy. So that's why this program is extremely important. Jim? Well, the bad news is the fund may be closed, but the good news is uh, Marin does have a great newsletter called Katusa's Resource Opportunities. So go to katusaresearch.com and you can get his Hit all of his um, buys and what he's doing and what his subscribers are, are benefiting from. So 
katusaresearch.com uh, and sign up for that newsletter because I'm signing up for it. And so what you said, Marin, was that the oil companies should define themselves as energy companies, not oil companies. They're, they're going to have no choice but to do so if they want to survive. And more importantly, to get the capital, you nailed it on the head when you called it, you know, the cosmic accounting. I call it quantum economics. And we've gone from a linear world to a quantum economics. And it's going to be fueled by MMT. And to get access to be able to keep going with their bonds and their debt and their projects, they're going to have to be certified under ESG. They're going to have to meet the environmental and the social governance and all those aspects. And the only way the oil patch is going to survive is using my formula, which is the GBOs, because they're not oil companies anymore. If they are, they're going to be depleted. And people forget like, you know, OPEC, they keep focusing on oil for years. In my book, I talked about, you got to focus on the liquids. You know, what are they doing? It's not just oil. What are the products that within the oil that they have? And as you know, I call it the liquid sector. Uh, that's going to be government funded from like, you know, China and Russia, that aspect. But for the North American companies, Exxon, Chevron, BP, which is the big, you know, the Queens oil company, Royal Dutch, they are going to have no choice but to tap into all that new quantum money being printed by the government, they're going to have to meet the environmental standards and they're going to have to change the way their accounting has been done. And they've done it already with the natural gas. It's just a natural evolution to green. And are you ready to really get all the champagne socialists uh, angry at us? Uh, Robert, you and I think very alike. Nuclear is a GBO also. And although the environmentalists haven't accepted it yet, you know, I've debated the founder of Greenpeace and then another, the other founder of Greenpeace became a close friend. His name is Patrick Moore. They've come to accept the science of it. And it's still early days in the green revolution. And they're sticking to things that make them feel good. But after billions of dollars gets wasted, they're still going to need to feel good, but they're going to need things that make sense. And nuclear is part of the diversified energy matrix as is hydro, there's a place for wind, there's a place for solar, but it can't just all be wind, it can't all be solar, it can't all be nuclear. And this is you know, what I talked about in my book, diversified energy matrix, and that's what the end result will be. But the people that can see that and position themselves are going to make a fortune here. And those that don't are gonna lose a fortune. And real simply, what, what Marin is talking about is Kodak didn't redefine themselves. You know, they they define themselves as a film company when, when uh, digital was coming out. And they invented digital. And so what you're saying, these oil companies are sitting there, but they're defining themselves as an oil company. But they really are defining themselves as an energy company. And to do that, they need the conversion of your GBOS equivalent, which is... You know, it's calculus, and I understand, I understand especially the pluses and minus, but I don't understand the rest of it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the the integrals look fancy, but, you know, it's pretty sound, and the accountants will understand it. And, you know, once they get to that point, and here's the reality, BP just had three-day investor conference, and they basically came out and spelled the future. They redefined uh, their business. They, they flat out said, we cannot survive any other way. We have to get into the green energy are, game. Are other big uh, oil companies totally. doing the same? All of the North American and European companies are going to accept that. Now, will Saudi Aramco do that? No. Will uh, you know, the Russian oil companies? No. So they're going to do what's best for them. But the North American and European companies have to uh, meet the cri criteria of also making money, but also meeting the needs of the environmentalists, the politicians. And like I said, the flow of money won't come in unless they accept this new, the new world that we're in. So how, do you, how does an investor make money with Marin Katusa? So what we've did is very simply, we've played, I don't do many stocks, number one. You don't need to buy that many stocks. Don't, like, if you don't have, think about it this way, you know, Everyone thinks that you need to have 25 gold companies or 25 energy companies. That's total BS. Just pick the best. You know, I, I don't believe in having too many of anything. You don't also need to go to risky parts of the world. Geopolitical risk is going to be bigger than ever before. And again, the bankers, the analysts, they're mispricing risk, for example. 
they're giving a discount rate for something in a DRC in the Congo, in, in, in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, the same discount rate as something in Nevada. Something your, if your gut <laughs> says this doesn't make sense, it's yeah. not, but it's, they're there to sell it. Now, over 55%, 55% of all the capital raised for resources is in those risky parts in the world like Zambia and Zimbabwe. So the bankers, if they say, hey, Robert, we only want you to invest in the good places where the rule of law is the rule of law, they're going to have half the income. They don't care about you. They care about making fees and bees. The banks are all about fees and bees. They don't put their risk at on the table, they put your risk at the table. Well, I'm a major player in this and I'm saying, don't go there. They're gonna steal your assets. You've lived it, I've lived it. So number one, you don't need to go up the risk curve to get doubles and triples. I've proven it with Brookfield. And, and again, I'm not telling anyone to buy it. I'm just telling you what I did and my subscribers did in March. And Brookfield is almost 200% gain and it pays an incredible dividend, the biggest dividend in the industry. It's only gonna get bigger and better. They have the lowest cost of capital and every single asset they have is in a positive swap line nation. So you sit there and going, I don't have to worry about nationalization. I don't have to worry about uh, a coup happening in the country and the new warlord demanding new terms. You don't have to deal with any of that. So my whole thesis is stick to the best, the lowest quartile producers, management teams that have a lot of skin in the game, and sound business. And, and, and that's an example of what we did in the energy patch. And is this an example too of what you talk about in your newsletter? Yeah, so that's exactly, and it, and it went real time. I send an alert, I say, this is how much I'm buying at this price, here's the reason why. Another great one would be uh, Equinox. My good friend, Ross Beatty is the chairman. I became one of the largest shareholders in the company. I said, I'm buying at this price. You can also get in at this price, whether it's through financing or the open market. And we're sitting on three, four hundred percent gains and the company's future is only going to get better. And yet the largest shareholder in the company is the chairman. Skin of the game where me and my subscribers got in at a lower cost base than the guy who's running the company. And that's all there in the report. I go to the site visit. I bring my film crew. And, and I get it, lots of construction workers, teachers, dentists, businessmen, they can't do what I do, but I bring my film crew and then you could see what I'm doing. I videotape me talking to the geologists on site, the drillers, the engineers, the management team, we go to the core shack. We do, I try to write and show you visually what I do. And then I say, this is the money I'm putting up. And no, not a single company, we don't get a penny for any of that. It's my money at risk, my subscribers money at risk, and we have the top track record in the industry by doing it that way. And it's, it's a philosophy where, you know, it might go four months, five months that I won't have a recommendation. That's just the way it goes. But our industry is based off of the first Wednesday of every month. You have to buy this stock. That makes no sense. It's actually backwards. So my style is different, um, but it's worked really well. So Marin, the, the reason what you're saying is important is what you're saying that's going to be this big shift coming in the financial services industry. I it's mean, here. Form, it's already here. It's already here. It's and here. the problem is how do you know if they're real or fake? That's exactly that's because they're going to use the same jargon, the same terms, but you don't know how real they are because they have one goal that, you know, the, basically Wall Street is to make money. They're not, they're not in the, the only way they make money is they're going to sell you something. And you're not doing that the bankers, the analysts, the lawyers, the accountants, they all take money out of the companies that you're investing in. They don't invest in them. They're, they say, we're not allowed. It might be you know, judicial, but they want you to take all the risk. So think about it. A banker, the brokerage firm, the analysts, the, uh, the lawyers, for every, uh, let's say, for every dollar invested in a company, before the company even gets a dollar, about 15 to 20% is already taken off for regulatory oversight, whether, you know, management, accounting, legal, banking fees, all that stuff. So the investors are already at an 80%, 20% uh, higher risk than those guys. They've taken their money and they're gone to the next deal. So you really got to pay attention to what is going on in the nitty gritty details. And this is, yes, where it, it, it's important to become a math nerd at looking at the financial balance sheets, the numbers and understanding numbers can lie. 
if you don't know how to look at the financial statements and see what it makes sense, who's writing these third party engineering reports, look at their history. Are they just a bunch like losers lose and winners win? Look at the people who've signed off on this. Are their last five deals also crappy? Or are these guys the rock stars and the toughest in the industry? Those are the details you have to look in. And looking at a company PowerPoint or an analyst firm that's getting paid by the company to write it up makes no sense. So that's why people in the industry think I'm an asshole or thinking that I'm a jerk but I don't take fees from these companies and I've raised more money than any brokerage firm in Canada. I want it all going into the company and why should I pay some banker who's wearing a slick suit, nice hair, flies on a private jet for doing what? Taking, telling me where to put my money? Uh, I think I'll stick to my own way. Okay, so, so we're running out of time here, but I have a personal question to you that we discussed first before this. So you can say what you want because we're dealing in dangerous territory here. And it has to do with this company called Uranium One. And, you know, that's the Clinton Foundation and all those guys were in that one. And um, that's what I mean. It's dangerous because a lot of times, because Kim and I raise a lot of money, a lot of capital. And we, all, we always knew the people we invested for. We, we, we explained the risk up front. But in this line of work, financial services work, it's a lot of smokescreen. And so Uranium One was really a Russian company portrayed as kind of a Canadian company. And so that's what, what Marin does is he looks into these things. So without getting yourself in a world of trouble, what went on behind the scenes that the average guy didn't see? You know, it's like my friend Jim Records. He, he just loves going after Uranium One. Okay. The Clinton so I know Jim well, he's a good guy. Let, let's go back to the inception of what happened. Uh, there was a company called Eurasia. It was financed by Frank Justra. And I was not there, so I don't know the exact details. But the story is that, you know, they somehow got contracts in Kazakhstan, which had incredible potential in Eurasia. Was that, was that, then it merged. Biden's place? <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> these incredible assets in Kazakhstan under Eurasia merged with another company called EMC Metals, which had a bunch of North American or mainly US assets at the time uh, in Wyoming ISR projects. Now, when those two companies merged, that became the Uranium one that we know of today. Then the Uranium market hit the tank. The Russians bought it at a big discount. This is something that people forget. So the North American investors didn't do that well in it. When you look at the average cost of capital that it traded in the North America markets during the peak of the uranium market versus what the Russians ended up buying for it. And that's where guys like Ian Telford were the chairman. So that's where the big controversy came about how could US assets, critical assets, strategic assets like uranium be held by uh, Russian foreign owned sources, right? And that's what Uranium One was. So at that time, I know this is going to sound crazy, but more uranium production in America was owned by Russians than all the American owned production in America at that time. So that became a big sticking point. Plus the Clintons were involved. So it was easy to poke in the story. So the company that owns that today is called Uranium One. They've only done one interview in North America. Uh, the, C the new CEO, his name's Fletcher Newton. It was with me uh, because of my background in uranium and I've been to all these assets. Uh, he did a good interview. Eventually what I see is you had the uh, RSA, the Russian suspension agreement just came out. The Russians are gonna have less of a field to play. And I think they're gonna probably eventually sell off their US owned assets because their bread and butter is in Kazakhstan. Now, Uranium One is Russia's largest uranium producer outside of Russia. So it's a very important vehicle. And is it backstopped by the Russian government? Of course it is. You know, think about was, Amer was Exxon backstopped by America in the 40s and 50s and 60s? Of course it was, right? Nobody wants to talk about those aspects, but you know, these are smart people. Like Fletcher Newton's a good guy. He's a smart guy and he's not Russian. Okay, so they, they have that whole aspect and, and they're moving away. So I think the smoke and fire that they deal with in, in America is kind of a, 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 a distraction for them and it's not their future source. And I think if they would go back in time, they probably wouldn't have done the transaction because it didn't make 
mathematical sense for them. So there's obviously other reasons that it had. Yeah, so and the reason that's important is because like Reckens is a friend of mine, he was working with the CIA. And uh, what he said was that all of a sudden something got smoke screened and uranium one slid through and he looked into it, it was because of the Clintons. And they got past something called syphilis. Sounds like syphilis, but it was syphilis. <laughs> Well, they, there was definitely an FTD for shareholders, a financially <laughs> transmitted disease there, okay? So, um, look, I'm not looking for trouble. I like Russia. No, 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 no. I like Americans. I like everybody. But, uh, <laughs> and I was never a shareholder of Uranium One. So, I'm just throwing it all on the table. Anyway, that's why I'm so closely, you know, I, uh, I like studying it because what, it's not the stock. It's the story going beyond the stocks. Yeah. It was going on behind the scenes. The point here is this, is energy, as, as Paul Bucky Fuller said, my teacher, on cosmic accounting. He says, back in the 80s, he says, there's four billion billionaires. What God gave us is energy for free. And what, cap, what not capitalism, but the greedy capitalists have done is basically took what was given for free and charged people for it. I kind of like it, I mean, personally. Well, but Nikola Tesla said the exact same thing in 1908. And, um, you know, the reality of where we are is this is the system we live in. And I'm a very, because I'm Canadian, I'm very pragmatic in the situation I'm in. Uh, I like making money. It's what I'm good at doing. And that's what my subscribers want. I can't change the world like how champagne socialists think they can have some fundraiser, put on their cocktail dresses and just shit on people like me and you who are out there doing it. But we're solving the problems, right? So that's number one. Number two is there's some serious big money to be made in this trend. And there's going to be a lot of mistakes. There's going to be a lot of scams. There's going to be a lot of wasted government money, just like you mentioned, Salandra and other deals from Obama's green dream. But just like I proved it with Altera and Brookfield, there's going to be incredible assets here that there's a way to play it. And, and I do believe what BP and some of the big oil companies, they're going to transform themselves and come out of this stronger and better than ever before. Because remember, they are in the energy business and it all comes down to cost of capital. That's why a startup their cost of capital will be, you know, 15, 16, 17%, where someone like a Brookfield, the biggest in the industry is maybe two or 3%. So how could a startup, their cost is, it's visa rates. They have to build this thing on a visa versus someone who's getting like preferential agreement by 2% because they're a lower risk function to the bankers. You can't win that game. And that's what I've been trying to avoid people because the startup sounds sexy. We're going to build this billion dollar project at 17% interest. Good luck. Like I know this industry. Well, it ain't going to happen. Aaron, you just made my whole day. You know, we, we talk about my favorite subject which is cosmic accounting that God gave everything up for us for free. And so, as Fuller said, you know, God's giving us all the sunlight for free, but somebody has to figure out how to put a meter between you and the sun, you know, and, yeah. and really that's what, that's what, pisses off Alexandria Cort Ocasio-Cortez and all the socialists out there. But the problem with socialists is they don't know how to make money. And what- yeah, they're, um, not, they're not problem solvers. Yeah, and yeah. what you're talking about is the biggest business in the universe. So I wanna thank you, Marin. It's always enjoyable talking to you. You're a great friend and very smart guy. Not bad for a calculus teacher. <laughs> Thanks guys, stay healthy. Thank you, Marin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll be, right we'll be talking. back for the summary. Thank you. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad uh, Radio Show, the good news and bad news today about energy. It's the biggest industry in the world. I want to thank Marin Katuasa, he's a dear friend of the Rich Dad Company. And there's few guys I love more than him because, you know, definition of intelligence is if you agree with me, you're intelligent. And what he was talking about, you know, my, my term is cosmic accounting. He called it quantum accounting, is that God wanted humans to be rich. And people figured out a way to put a, a, a money between you and what God gave you for free. And so the Rich Dad Company was actually founded on that principle, cosmic accounting. Now Rich Dad is known as an accounting. You know, people think we're, we're, we're real estate, we're not. We're really about accounting. But we're taking this to a whole nother level. It's called cosmic accounting. How much money is God sending to you every single day 
that you have to pay for. <laughs> Any comments, Kim? Well, I, this was really refreshing because, you know, I've, you and I both, we've always been, I've always been a fan of green energy. I've always supported solar and clean oceans and clean air and all of this um, wind, wind and, and geothermal, all of it. But you get, you get boxed into this little thing that says, oh, oh you're, you're, one of a, you're a greenie. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You just want to destroy all capitalism. Well, what Marin's talking about is a, a capitalist need for these energies, these oil companies, to convert to be green energy companies. It's going to be, it's diverse. It's, I mean, it's it just biggest, makes sense. He's talking about the biggest industry coming. Yeah. And, and you know, thank, thank you, God, for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and for us, yes. those green commie pinkles out there. Because when they're talking about the Green New Deal, we're going to get rich. They're not going to get any richer because they're going to say we should give it to them. Well, they're going to say the government's going to take, kind of pay for it, or we're going to give contracts to all these companies. They have no idea what they're doing. Who's yeah. going to pay for it? Taxpayers. And there'll be a lot of ripoffs, just, uh. just like you know during the dot com boom, everybody was jumping into dot com. Everybody's going to be jumping into the Green New Deal. Please keep government out so, of business. So Marin Katusa is the guy with his GBOEs, Green Barrels of Equivalent Oil Equivalent. Anyway, I really appreciate it. Any comments there, Sarah? Um, this show, I felt like it kind of uh, expounded on our conversation with Jeff Booth about the creative disruption in a, in a sector. And I felt like this kind of is that with, with BP changing from an oil company to now, I mean, they're catching on. And his equation, his calculus is kind of that thing that they needed to yeah. To, to move it forward, it, to prove to it, prove it right. right? So I just it kind of reminded me of that. But um, Marin's a great guy, great guest, and I always love having him on. A calculus teacher, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> but a I, teacher it, turned investor. That doesn't happen. But the thing is, he's talking about cosmic accounting. Mm -hmm. God wants you to be rich. The problem is there's stuff in between you and God. So it's a fantastic program. Plus that he's a resource guy. I yeah. mean, Kim and I. We, I especially have traveled the world looking at gold and silver and oil and all this all over the world. And he's done the same thing. But we're coming back to the same place. It's really as energy because civilization runs on energy. And if we can get the price of energy down, not only the price down, but less polluting, mm -hmm. the world wins. Yeah. So that's how I like what you call champagne, what? Socialist. Champagne socialists. That's <laughs> my <it>. new phrase. <laughs> we got the world full of champagne socialists, you know? As long as a good drink, good drink, good champagne. <laughs> okay, final words, Ken. That's it. I'm I'm loving it. And uh, KatusaResearch.com. I'm definitely gonna make sure I get his newsletter. And his newsletter is called Katusa Resources Opportunities. Once again, we don't recommend anything. We're purely educational company. So thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show and Cosmic Accounting. Thank you. Thank you.